Um, so first of all, let's uh, say thank you to all the organizers for this awesome event. So far, I've only seen great talks, so that's how it's going to be the whole day, I'm sure. So. Yay! <laughs> and I have a clicker, and it's supposed to be working, and I don't know why it's not working, but let's see. First of all, like, this is actually 15 years of Chrome, so Chrome is turning 15 years, this just happened, so it's kind of funny. And they were asking people on Twitter, people that worked on Chrome for a long time, like me, like, what did you do when you were 15? And the funny thing is, it's like, okay, let's think back. And I found out that I was just playing around with Netscape. Uh, they just released Netscape at that point, and that was actually one of the things that got me into working on the web. So my journey started with Mosaic, and then uh, very shortly after, I got Netscape and I got totally booked out on the web page. After that, I worked for a company called Nokia. You might know that. They used to make cell phones, they still do make some cell phones. It used to be a big company, and then uh, something happened. So I actually worked on a browser called the N9 browser. Um, so I led that team, uh, one of the lead developers on it, and we actually made a really good browser. It was kind of funny. Uh, oh, sound on it. Nice. <laughs> Um, but then we got this guy called Steve Neal up, he came in and everything had to be Windows Phone. Just done here? So... Oh, yeah. oh yeah. okay, yeah. now where's that from? Yeah, yeah. 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 So, and, uh, yeah, well, they didn't need a browser guy anymore because they had Windows Phone, so I went ahead and I joined a company called Intel. So, uh, I work at Intel, I work on web standards, um, mostly, and browser engineer. Uh, and I've been basically working on the web for around 15 years. Um, I'm also one of the co-inventors of something called Progressive Web Apps, which you might be familiar with. Um, I've also sat on the World Wide Web Consortium Technical Activity Group uh, for around five, uh, four years, and uh, now I'm also involved with like new capabilities and bringing that to the web. If, if you use Twitter or X here, you can follow me there. So the first thing that people always ask me is like, Intel, you're a semiconductor, you make chips, why do you care about software? Why are you working on a browser? That's really weird. But the thing is that the world that everything today runs on software. And if you don't have the features that your hardware, all the features that your hardware enables, if they're not in enabled for web developers, well, if people are writing web apps, they can't use it. So why are you paying for it? So at Intel, we really value like openness, trust, uh, and choice. So we work on a lot of open source projects and a lot of, on a lot of different standards. And uh, I care a lot about sustainability, and we do quite great there as well, so that's really uh, nice. But I really care about, because like all those platforms we have, what really matters is the experiences that you can create as a developer. Uh, and, and we also need to meet the developers where they are. Like, what are the platforms they, uh, they're targeting? Um, what skill sets do they have? Uh, are they going to write like a native or cross-platform solution? It also depends on money. Maybe you don't have the money to have five different teams running a Windows app, a Mac OS app, an iPad app, an Android app, etc. So we've seen that the web has been doing really, really great. Uh, so at Intel, we consider the web like one of the core and unquestionable key uh, application platform for developers today. And one want to enable like, the core building blocks to create applications uh, while they have to be like fast and performant and, and offer like great capabilities to build all kinds of applications, not just like uh, maybe just games, maybe you want to build something that talks to like uh, Bluetooth, that should also be possible. But we want to do it in a way that uh, we stay true to the web, so it has to stay cross-platform, uh, work across all these different OSs, uh, sites should continue loading instantly, um, and it needs to be safe, because people visit a lot of different websites every day, uh, so we want it to remain safe. And we're actually doing quite well. Uh, so we have like solid uh, application building blocks, uh, we have the web app manifest service so where you can make an app that works offline, that's installable. Um, a lot of great things come to CSS, like CSS Grid, there's now container queries which developers have been asked for since forever. There's OpenUI working on bringing new HTML elements to the browser. Uh, one recent thing that was uh, shipping is like a popover. Uh, there's new things like around the navigation API. So it's easier to write, instead of having to have all these routers that try to work around the platform, then like, let's just fix the platform instead. And at Intel, we really care about performance, because like, if you make a chip and you want to make it faster and faster, you really should care about performance. So we've been working on uh, WebAssembly, 
um, the media pipeline, because a lot of media happening on the web, um, as well as machine learning. So, we want developers to be able to bet on the web. So, create experiences with ease, uh, sometimes fixing some of the magic of the platforms and the frameworks by bringing that to the web platform itself. Um, we also want uh, not just to have AP, like APIs that are used by all developers, we want to target also like special use cases, so there should be room for everyone on the web. Uh, like I mentioned, like most websites probably won't use Bluetooth, but if you have a product that depends on Bluetooth, uh, it's really nice to have that available. Um, but we also want to be there for the next big thing that's coming. Like today, that seems to be AI, but also what comes after that. And we're actually doing quite well. So uh, there's a, a project that was started uh, with all the browser vendors on fixing interoperability between browsers. So one thing is that browsers support all the same APIs, but if the behavior, behavior is different, that's really an issue for developers. So I'm really glad that this has uh, happened. And every year uh, we, we come up with new ideas and actually, I don't know if it's over now, but people could uh, submit proposals to what APIs they believe browsers should focus on making interoperable uh, for every year. And we do that every year. And as you can see, like this is really good. Uh, and it just means that more and more of the web becomes common across all browsers. This has been a great, uh, like the whole betting on the web thing has been a great thing for Intel. Uh, there's around like 17 or 4 million JavaScript developers out there. That's a lot. Um, we know from our statistics that more than 65% of the time on a desktop computer is just running web code. But it's actually more than that. Uh, because a lot of those other apps that we don't count as browser apps are maybe electron apps. Uh, like it could be Visual Studio Code. It also works just on the web. Uh, it could be Microsoft Teams that's totally built with web technology, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just like a, a breakdown of, of, uh, of our stats. Like last time we looked at it, and as you see, the number one app on Windows is Chrome. So that's a web browser. The second one is Edge. That's also a web browser. Third one is Firefox. You see that? That's also a web browser. Then you have like Outlook. Outlook today on Windows, the new version is a web app. Um, Kind of like a hybrid app, but it's it's very web-like. Uh, so it's, it's I guess it's more than 98% web-based. Um, then we have other internet browsers. Then we have like Excel and Word, and those also work. They also have web versions, and are investing more and more in those experiences. So really great. Around like capabilities, we've been uh, working on a project together with the. It was initiated by Google, and then we joined uh, together with Microsoft, Samsung, and Electron, and others. Uh, called Project uh, Fugu, uh, so it's Japanese, I think, I believe it's called Kugu or something like that. <laughs> so uh, this was the idea that, that uh, the puffer fish is dangerous uh, if you don't prepare it right uh, and it might actually kill you. So we know that bringing all those capabilities uh, to the web comes with danger, so we need to do it just right to make sure that we're not breaking the web, we're not making it unsafe to use the web. And this has been a great success. We started out by adding like major APIs, like file system API, develops in WordPress forever. Uh, we have better paste than we can copy and paste today. Um, and all new kind of new APIs, like for talking to, you just saw like a game controller, uh, you can do that on the web uh, using like uh, Bluetooth or, or web HID, the human interface definition things for USB. Uh, and all of this is already there, and now we are really targeting all the maybe not so big use cases, like the, the long tail, uh, and this has been a great success. So here are some examples. Um, it's kind of funny because I have a friend called Henning Augenberg, and he was working as the PM on Visual Studio Code, and I had discussions with him, like, why is Visual Studio Code not a progressive web app? And uh, well, there's a couple of reasons. So one of the reasons was like, well, we don't have access to local files, and a lot of people really like to have their files locally. Um, so I said, okay, well, that is, that is fixed now. Uh, they actually also had another issue around they were not able to run like, like plugins, because a lot of them require you to talk to like native binaries, so if you're using Python, you want to get Python syntax highlighting and other info that comes out of C Python, which is written in C. Uh, but today, with WebAssembly and something called Wasi, the WebAssembly used to be system interfaces, now, now it's standard interfaces. Um, that is actually also being possible. So Microsoft have this way that people just compile C, Python, 
to WebAssembly and WASI, and then it just runs. So you can actually today go to vscode.dev and start coding in your browser. It's pretty amazing, uh, and I've used that multiple times. Another example, one of the prime examples that people said, well, this is an app we're never gonna get on the web. That was Photoshop. And today we have Photoshop running in the browser. And it's, it's amazing that like, they had a lot of, you can imagine people editing in raw photos in Photoshop. Some of these files are huge. We're talking about gig, gigabytes, right? Uh, and how do you handle that? Well, normally in native app you do some swapping, but you couldn't do that on the web, but you can actually. Because now we have the origin private file system, like a private file system with uh, some specific ways of accessing files that's faster. So it's not general purpose as a regular file system. And that allows like Adobe to implement this caching super efficiently in the web browser. Um, but also other things like we, there's like SIMD, uh, that stands for single instruction multiple data. I'll come back to that. Uh, that's also featured in modern CPUs. And, and they went and optimized Halite, the one of the libraries. And there was one case where they had like a 160 times speed up. On average, it was like three to five or four times. But that's also pretty good. But it's, it's kind of really interesting. And we have that running on the web today. I find that amazing. And another example, this is actually using web Bluetooth. Uh, so that is like iRobot. They have this educational software. It's kind of like a, it's not like a cleaning robot, but it can draw. So you put like a, I believe you put a pen in it and you can have it draw on some paper. Um, and you just program it straight from your web browser. Really, really amazing. I've seen that Lego is doing something very similar. So one of the things we really care about is like safety and privacy. So a lot of the developers or users have this idea that if you have a native app, it's just safe because it's been reviewed. The truth is that that review is not always that great and it's half automated because like they get a lot of new apps to the app store every single minute and no one can actually review them manually. Um, plus, many of these APIs were designed long ago, so sometimes you get access to much more than you actually need. Uh, so kind of like, here you have access to everything. And then we're trying to limit it over time. Uh, so you see every time there's a new version of iOS or, or Android, it's like, okay, now maybe you need to ask for permission, uh, maybe this is not possible anymore, you have to rewrite the code. Uh, well, we can't do that on the web. So we've really been trying to be innovative. So for instance, an example with web Bluetooth. Um, the web browser, they can't see the device around you. You, the user, will have to click somewhere, like a connect button, it will show a list of devices around you. Those are not exposed to the site yet. You decide which one you want to connect to. Then they can make a connection. And that's only for that website, that origin. So, but we always try to innovate and find out other better ways we can do this. Um, and I think so far, like we've shown this has really worked. Like there has been any attacks with Web Bluetooth that existed for multiple years now. Uh, the current focus at Intel, or especially, uh, is like capabilities. So that's what I'm working on. And the other one is like performance. Actually, we, we, we like to say at Intel, no silicon left behind. Uh, so our team says like, no silicon left behind as everyone is moving to the web. That means that we need to enable everything on the web. And of course, we need to make sure that they're as fast as native apps. Otherwise, we're not staying competitive. So some of the APIs we've been working on is uh, like WebAssembly. Uh, so fast CPU execution, support for Cindy, talk about it later, multi-threading support. Uh, that was very important for Photoshop as well. Web GPU, modern uh, GPU API for the web. Uh, there's something called Web Neural Network, we'll also talk about that. And something called Compute Pressure, where you can kind of like adjust what you're doing depending on the pressure on the system. So here's one example. With, so this is the very advanced SIMD. Uh, uh, it stands for single instruction multiple data. Uh, so basically on the system, instead of saying, one number plus another number, you can maybe plus four numbers, like an array, like an array or like a vector of numbers at the same time. We actually sometimes have the code that our CPU support maybe 256 bits, so you can have multiple numbers. And, and this one example on Intel is that we just like try to like identify those cases automatically and convert them to use our hardware. And by doing that, we have like a, in one case is maybe it's 5.6 times faster. Uh, in every case, it's faster. So like, we're always working on these optimizations. Other examples is with web codec. So we identified, especially on the COVID, that a lot of people are doing media streaming on the web. 
And most hardware today, they have like hardware decoders. And that's really great because if you have an iPad, you get like 10 hours of just watching YouTube. But that was not always, maybe that worked with YouTube, but if you do your own custom thing, like your Zoom or your Google Meet, that was not the case. You're doing everything using software. Maybe you were using some libraries you ported with WebAssembly, just running on the CPU. While they understood my laptop has like hardware that could do this. So we exposed that to the web together with Google in, in an API called Web Codec uh, that really makes this, this possible. And, and that's great for battery life uh, and it's great for performance. Something else is uh, most chips today, you probably heard they have like different cores. You know, like Apple talk about performance cores and or big cores and little cores. Uh, well, our platforms have the same. So today we, we went into Chrome and we. We, we, like if you, a lot of things in Chrome is like using different threads, so we kind of like decorated to oh this is high performance, uh, this like has to happen right now, this can just happen in the background, it's not really important. And by doing this, we, we, we saved like 100 milliwatts of power uh, for, for video calling Windows, for instance. Uh, and we do this all the time. Also, like there's a lot of inter-process communication in Chrome. It's running many processes because of security, and we can go and redo some of these. This, 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 it's not just for Intel, it actually works for everyone. Uh, and just by doing this, we, we save like 10% of power, uh, for instance, for a video call, uh, for video playback. So th this is pretty amazing. WebGPU. So Intel has been very uh, heavily involved with WebGPU. Uh, as you can see on, on the timeline, uh, it shipped in May the 2nd. Uh, Firefox and Safari are working on it doing that as well. Uh, and it's supported by TensorFlow. We also saw that in a previous talk today. Uh, and it's being used in applications like Google Meet, Photoshop, Web Zoom, uh, to use some AI uh, based on that. Uh, and, and we've been heavily involved in making that actually shift. So WebGPU is like modern graphic, but one of the new things with WebGPU is that it allows you also to use the GPU for compute. So that's really great because you can use it for AI and machine learning. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and actually, Intel, we have contributed the, the backend for WebGPU to uh, TensorFlow.js. So if you're using TensorFlow.js, you can actually use WebGPU today. And that brings uh, a lot better performance if using WebGL. Like, this is more than 200, almost 230 percent faster, right? Uh, that's one case that's slow, I don't know why, but, but generally, it's much better. <laughs> that's probably just a bug that could be solved. Result. Here's one example of us actually using a stable distribution in the browser. It should be this plane. I'm not sure it's plain. Let me see. Oh, now it is. So, so this is just using WebGPU in the browser, and there you go. On the client, on your own computer, not running on, on the server. One of the things that people don't understand with, with the machine learning, because there's a lot of different hardware you can run machine learning on. You could use a CPU, or you could use like a discrete GPU, there's even like an integrated GPU in many laptops or on your phone, and then there's something you call like NPU or TPU, depending on who you ask. Uh, Apple, Google likes to call it TPU, everyone else calls it NPU. So it's a neural processing unit or tensor processing unit. The thing here is that there's no, there's not one piece of hardware that's better for it, that's the best for everything. Uh, an NPU is normally not the fastest, but it uses way less like battery power, like way less power. So this is great for sustained. Uh, for instance, if background blurring on your, on your laptop, you want to get as much battery as possible. It doesn't have to be the fastest. Uh, generally, if you need to run a lot, like especially a lot of the training with AI. Uh, you know, we use it with a discrete GPU, but you see it has some kind of like startup cost, so it's not the cheapest, but for sustained, when you're doing like AI all the time, it's great. But if you just need to calculate something really fast, uh, you're not using sustainable all the time, like streaming, well then there's sometimes the CPU is actually better. Um, so we really want to uh, enable all of that on the web. One of the other funny thing is that sometimes you just have AI in the background. It doesn't always have to be an API. Uh, so for instance, Zoom, we collaborate with Zoom, they do like video, uh, video meetings, etc. And then there's not with the camera, so there's a lot of things where you could use AI to, to fix the eye gazing, remove noise, um, do background blurring. 
So we've been working on actually bringing those things to the web as well. So they just kind of like, just like a, a setting, say like, oh, please do background blurring. Uh, maybe there's a few knobs you can change, like maybe you want to do heavy background blurring or not so heavy. And it'll just like use the best hardware available. And you don't need to do anything beyond that. But if you want to do that, we'll be bringing a new API called uh, Web Neural Network. We're working on bringing that to the web uh, together with Google and Microsoft. Uh, and this was really, really interesting for, for me, especially for my team. This was a very proud moment. Uh, because Intel was like talking about this new chip we were launching in December 13 or 12, I don't remember the day. Uh, and it's called like um, Mitchell Lake, it's like the code name. But on the slides, they, they show like web neural network on the slides. And this is like the first time anything we've worked on it got on like one of the public roadmaps. And it was like, wow, we're really starting to affect what we're doing at Intel. Uh, and it's really nice to be part of that. And a lot of excitement is building up. Um, there's people from Microsoft saying like, we're all working on the WebNN that can do local inference in, in browser. We also implement the WebNN standard work with Intel. It's coming soon at this point. So this is here that Microsoft is really, really excited about this new API and has been collaborating with us a long time. So you might be wondering, but why do we need all these APIs on the web? Well, we, we kind of like don't want to put the, the web in a disadvantage against native, so it's nice to have these APIs, but it also allows like developers, you, to create like new experiences that you couldn't do without it. And performance is much, much better. So look at this. The one is like the, the standard thing. This is the performance you get. If you compare it to the native implementation, uh, it's like nine point. It's almost 10 times faster. If you didn't take this as using WebAssembly, if you didn't take to modify it, maybe use the simple single instruction of all the data, all of that, oh, it's three times faster. That's the speed up. But with a WebNN, it's very, very comparable to a native speed. And then that means that, that we're not putting it at disadvantage uh, towards like native implementations. So it's like a new version of web standards. Uh, it's not a very user friendly, it's like a very low level API. So it's really for AI framework offers. So people do like TensorFlow or Onyx and all of these libraries uh, would be the target audience for this API. But it also allows like very much more direct access to the underlying hardware. Even compared to web GPU, most developers are probably not going to use web GPU directly. They're going to use like 3GS or Babylon JS. Uh, if you look at the options we have for web GPU for uh, machine learning on the web today, we have like web assembly as a CPU only. We have web GPU that's going to run only on the GPU. But with WebNN, we're really going to target all the different kinds of hardware you can use. So, just to show if this is a, a very low level API, uh, so not for average Joe developers. Uh, this is kind of like what developers will use. Normally, you use a specific library, maybe to do like noise suppression, background segmentation, or maybe go a little bit lower and you use like Onyx or Google's MediaPipe or TensorFlow.js. I have actually one example of this. Uh, I don't have any connection to audio here. But I will uh, probably just turn it off the sound. No. So this is an example of one of my colleagues from uh, China. Uh, so he's doing this example where he's going to show you uh, WebAssembly and uh, WebNN implementation. So this is background blurry. Uh, you can see here the, the, the FPS using Simply and the WebNN. And I think it was something like three times faster. Let's see. So you see this is a bit slow, uh, 74, 60 frames per second. And of course like this is also taking more battery power because it's using the CPU. Uh, but then we're using with WebNN and you see like wow, this is like 150 frames per second, 100 fast. It's based on the minimum value of power, as you can see. And you see like it's 2.3 times faster. There's also another example uh, where it's doing background segmentation. Or background replacement. It is a very typical model in self segmentation. And I will compare the web assembly performance. So, this is the same comparison that I was just showing. But trying to replace the background with your own image. Replacement. 
process and change the background of that person. It's wrong on self is segmentation now. So you see 60 frames per second, uh, sometimes it's lower? By using the web assembly backend, you can see. Oh, this is web assembly. Oh, it's very slow. Like 7, 8 frames per second. It is not really useful. It's about 7 in the indicators. But if we then can use this uh, web assembly, the uh, webnet, web you see it's like it's much faster now. Still not the best, but it's like 30 frames per second. <coughs> Definitely uh, an improvement. So that was uh, uh, webnet. Something else we're working on, or something I actually personally worked on, is uh, <coughs> compute pressure API. So we know that the system has it's probably going to be renamed to system pressure. Uh, we're talking about that. Uh, but like the different pressure types on a system, it could be like or oh, people are running a lot of things on our machines get really slow, the CPU is almost overheating. Or the same thing could be like with memory pressure, like it's almost running out of memory. Uh, and sometimes users would really like that information so they can create a better user experience. <coughs> One example is, you, a lot of people know this from streaming. You know that if you watch Netflix, they say, oh, they're, they're looking at the bandwidth for the network connection. Say, yeah, okay, the, the, it's not, it can't really show 4K, so it's lower the resolution. We're not going to have so very blocky or janky video, we just lower the resolution. <coughs> That's one example of how you can react to these kind of pressures. So, with CPU pressure, you might want to adjust the resolution, you might want to skip some of these machine learning, enable funny hats, so it, uh, effects, or whatever you have, uh, and we want to enable all of that. But it's kind of really difficult. I talked about privacy before. <coughs> and actually, one of the things is, Pressure on a system is a global thing. So if various websites can get access to that, they could probably identify you as a user. They might even be able to do a side channel attack. And actually, that is possible because I have implemented it and we have found mitigation for it. <laughs> so, so that then might actually mean that you someone who sent data from one website to another, and none of us can do it. See, like, for instance, like, imagine you're on a website you're not supposed to be. Uh, what's it talking about? You don't want your Nets, uh, like your Facebook to know about it. But if they're collaborating and Facebook sends out your ID and that other website says, ah, yeah, uh, now I know who that user is and they sell that back to Facebook, that would be really bad for privacy. So we really need to fix all these things and think about all these cases while we bring these things to the web. So it's a huge challenge. Uh, it's not just like enabling uh, an API. On the web, we really need to take care of these uh, problems. So what we ended up with is we have like four states. Uh, nominal states, not much going on in the system. Fair, yeah, it's doing some work, but it could do more. Uh, serious, like okay, it's doing fine, but it's getting close to the limit. And critical, you should probably stop what you're doing or try to do less, otherwise it's gonna have a negative effect on the user experience. So one example, this is a small demo I made. So you see I, I made this uh, nice emoji thing that will show like, oh, so no more pressure, I'm doing fine. Uh, and then I have some simulation with a mental rock <coughs> running on different workers. So I can have more workers. So I'm see I'm adding more. And it becomes like serious pressure. Add a few extra. And now it's getting critical. The system, the, span, the fan starts spinning and it becomes maybe a bit unresponsive. <coughs> Turn it off and you're back just to show you that it's, it's highly responsive. Yeah. <coughs> so this is something we're working with. Uh, we work with uh, multiple people actually very ex excited about this. So I know that uh, Slack has been prototyping with it. Uh, same as Whereby soon. And uh, not long ago, Microsoft told us they're looking into using it for Excel. And if you Excel, why do they need this? Well, the thing is Excel, you have like a lot of rendering of, of uh, cells because it's a spreadsheet. But many times, people are doing something in the background. Maybe they're, uh, I don't know, playing a video game or there was a encoding a video and it became really slow. So they had this problem that when people start typing things, like the responsiveness was really, really bad. So for Microsoft, it's much better that then, okay, we show like a degraded UI or show some um, skeleton UI instead. But we want like the input to be fast, so you see what you're doing, and not like a minute later you get like 500 characters. So 
it's, it's really exciting. But like we worked on many other things, we like I said, like media, doing covers, wow. Look at those numbers. Like Google, we had a 30 time increase in daily users doing COVID because like everyone started to work remotely uh, and you and then start to use these tools for, um, for the work. So we've been working on this uh, a lot because it's a big use case for, for the laptops. So now we have like 20% better, better battery life for teams and meets. Uh, YouTube on the web is just as efficient as the native version. Soon using web codec, they got a 75% video encoded latency reduction. Really, really great. And just an example of uh, what we've been collaborating with Zoom on is like many different connectivity, we work on web tra transport, uh, web uh, RCC, real time communication, smoothness is web workers and web codec, uh, low latency is also codec, but also web audio, and all these different APIs to make sure that these things just run really well on the web. But we also talked to them, what do developers actually need to create these experiences? Uh, like, what can provide them out of the box with the best solution, like for background blowing? So some of these were like lighting correction, background blowing, face detection, uh, etc. And we worked on this. So this is uh, someone from our team uh, showing a native background blowing. So this just uses the best hardware available, if available, on your system. And you see that it works pretty well. You can't see the person in the background. Great. Uh, we looked at, we tried to ship some of these things, and uh, maybe the API has changed since uh, I made this slide. But you see, it's really just like a few lines of code. You say, I want to enable this. And we'll do everything the best way possible on the system. And in, in this example, uh, this is uh, the power consumption while not doing any of these things. If you're using TensorFlow with the body picks, it's 2.5 2 times, no, oh, a little bit less, 2.3 times as much as using more battery power. If you use a media pipe, that's another Google tool for this. It's even more, it's 2.5, that's what they're using in the meat. And uh, without proposal, it, it's basically the same. It's a little bit more. Uh, that was to be expected. Uh, face detection. Uh, to me, it's like. Oh, okay, okay, I'm going to be quick. With face detection, it's kind of the same like we initially did with the. Uh, uh, Open CV, very big thing, 8 megabytes to download, it's a bit too big. Google, I use the media pipes too. Uh, now we're working on just bringing this to WebRTC, so it runs automatically. So, as an example, so we do face detection, it even works with multiple people. So, if someone should be joining, yeah, another co worker, if he, yeah, and it detects two people. Same thing. People just saying, oh, this is a bounding box. We're working on maybe doing some like detecting faces with the contour, so you can do like a nice effects, etc. Uh, same thing, a little bit, uh, of course, it's going to use a bit more power, but it's much better than the solution people are using today. And same thing with like the automatic framing, turning on the, following the camera. Some cameras actually have that built in that they can do automatic zoom, like with hardware, uh, even to pan and tilt. So we can use that as well. Same thing. We may be doing this. There's a definitely plan for maybe even like doing the automatic eye gaze correction. Uh, so we're actually modifying the image so it looks like you're looking at the screen and not at your camera. Uh, because you're not looking at the camera, you're looking at the screen, so it looks like you're looking at your camera. Uh, opposite. <laughs> or like just automatically doing like all the lighting corrections. So great. So I only have two minutes, so um, Hi everyone, my name is Alex. I'm sure I'm just here yeah. to tell you a little bit more about the work that we've been doing to improve the affordable uh, devices on the web. So here's a little example. I have this gallery demo where you can scroll through your pictures and then if you select one, then it opens it for screen, trying to use the available uh, screen states to show you the picture as big as possible. Um, that was great, however, when I unlock the keyboard on the foldable device, I have this express screen state that comes down. But then, because the, the gallery hasn't been adapted for them, then you can see that it tries to lay out the picture in the middle of the fold, which is not really a, a great user experience, um, especially if I use, for example, a portrait picture that looks really odd. Um, now, I have the same demo, but with the API installed on, and uh, for photos, we have adding two new APIs, so the device posture allows you to 
uh, get the overall pressure of the device as the device being used, as well as the viewport segment, which takes information about the top section, the foot section, and the bottom section. So for that same demo, if I, for example, select the picture, you can see that now we lay out the picture on the top section of the screen, which is a lot better. Um, here's another one in portrait, uh, which is what the user would expect. Now we went through a little bit further on this demo, and then when we use the device in book mode, then we call it actually a split UX. And you can see here, I can select the picture, and it shows on the right with extra information, right? So that's a preferable way to improve the user experience. And I have another demo that actually embraces the form factor. So I don't know if you call it, be familiar with this little demo, which is the full ship demo. Um, uh, it's like the battleship when we were young, where you have your enemy uh, uh, fleet and you have to try to find them, and you have your own fleet. Um, so in this case, I'm a bit limited in terms of screen state to display extra information. I have to basically display the most important part of the, of the game. Now, with a volleyball, I have a lot more screen state to play with, and I can do something like this, where I put the bottom section as your own fleet, and then the top section as your um, enemy fleet, just like the actual real physical game. And I use the full section as a playful area to display extra information. Another demo that actually leverages the form factor is this one. So this will be a typical news website, right? You scroll down with articles and pictures, now, if you rotate the device and read in book mode, then you can see that I'll create a paper quiz um, imitating a journal. And then if I put the uh, device in flat mode, and then it, it changes the layout, and then if I deploy the case, then, then I can have like, the actual normal screen um, layout, right, with no void. And if I put the device again, then the paper quiz will appear again. Okay. Thank you for watching, and uh, you will find more details in the link provided in the presentation. So, yeah, that was uh, one last example uh, for the time to show you all the different and all the very different features we're working on at Intel to improve the web and empower the web for all these future new experiences. And with that said, I hope you have a great experience. And uh, if you want to talk to me, I'll be around all day. So, thank you.